Thank you very much, Kai. And I'd just like to remind everybody that if you've got any questions for any of our speakers this morning, uh, please just type them into the chat. And also, there's been a few questions about whether we're recording the conference. And yes, just to reassure you, we are recording the conference. We're going to make it available on the John Gray Centre website in a few weeks time. Now I'd like to invite our next speaker up. We've got Rob Engel from AOC Archaeology. He's going to tell us about the medieval ceramic production site that they found at Roslyn. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this talk is based on a program of archaeological works um, which initially consisted of a metal detecting survey, an archaeological evaluation. <laughs> That's a good start. There we go. Uh, undertaken in March 2020, just ahead of the COVID uh, regulations being introduced. Uh, the works were required ahead of uh, a proposed residential development on approximately 12 uh, hectares of pasture land uh, situated on the northwest edge of Roslyn Midlothian. Based on the findings of the initial phases of work, uh, further mitigation followed in the form of a limited area strip and excavation. A third phase of works in the forms of uh, extra evaluation and a watching brief uh, were undertaken uh, due to limiting factors present during the initial works, uh, such as wet ground and uh, a few live services. Uh, as you can see, the site has several surrounding heritage assets of interest, including uh, Moat Farm to the west. Oops, wrong one. Um, uh, and um, this may have uh, medieval origins. Um, there's also uh, the remains of a 19th century railway which go uh, around the south and uh, east of the site. Um, Significant medieval remains are also present in the vicinity uh, in the form of the Ros uh, Battle of Roslyn in 1303, um, which abuts the development boundary on the east side of Main Street. Uh, the inventory battlefield boundary defines the area in which the main events of the battle are considered to have taken place and where associated physical remains and archaeological evidence uh, may be expected. Several local place names commemorate the battle, including Shimbane's Field, uh, Hewen Bog, Hewan Bank, uh, where much of the fiercest fighting was said to have occurred, and uh, the aptly named Stinking Rig, where bodies resulting from the battle were reputedly hastily buried and uh, emitted a rancid smell. In the late 15th century, the village of Roslyn was located at Bilston Burn, about a half a mile from where it now stands. Sir William Sinclair of Roslyn um, had the Masons who were building Roslyn Chapel build houses for themselves at the present site of the village so that they would be convenient for the work. Uh, Roslyn was erected a uh, burgh of barony in 1456. Uh, the 15th century origin of uh, the present day Roslyn um, may be uh, you know, quite linked to our findings, which I'll come to in a minute. Uh, we initially started a metal detecting survey, uh, which was undertaken uh, early in March and a total of 94 artefacts were recovered. Local residents had revealed that the fields had frequently been detected by hobbyists, um, which is uh, a normal occurrence in sites on the edges of towns and villages. Uh, nevertheless, a high number of targets were investigated, with the majority consisting of monotritis. Uh, this was removed and recycled as a matter of course. Uh, the vast majority of the finds were 19th or 20th century in date, although a number may be post-medieval. Um, none of the objects could be closely associated in form or function to uh, the Battle of Roslyn, unfortunately. Uh, here we can see two of the nicer artefacts, a decorative mount and uh, a horse bell. Moving on to the evaluation, uh, this was undertaken uh, from the 9th to the 19th of March 2020 and 44 trenches were excavated, uh, all of them revealing a well sorted improved sandy clay topsoil overlooking, uh, sorry, overlying a buried plough soil uh, which survived along the eastern part of the site and a subsoil of uh, boulder clay with patches of sands and gravels. 
the archaeological works intended to investigate uh, the area of Moats Farm, which we'll, you'll see to the uh, northwest. Um, however, this area was covered by a dense copse of trees, uh, making the area unsuitable for trenching. Um, no evidence was recorded uh, of the other known sites on the southern and western periphery of, of the site, uh, such as the colliery and uh, the rail line. Um, you can just see uh, on the eastern edge of the, the map there, um, 1504. That was the only um, site, uh, sorry, the only feature that we found. Uh, there's a picture of the site under evaluation. It's quite a nice area. All right. This was the exception on the site, a single large circular pit named 1504, uh, which was half sectioned and recorded. Uh, the pit was approximately 2.5 metres in diameter and had a broad U-shaped profile and a uh, maximum depth of uh, half a metre. Uh, that's uh, one of AOC's scales. We'll gloss over that. <laughs> um, at the base of the pit lay several closely uh, linked flat stones with a central depression forming what we thought at the time was a possible cap or apron. Um, Probably that was due to the weather. Um, the water made me think of a, of a well initially. Um, two sherds of medieval white gritty ware were recovered from the upper fill. And this was probably accidentally introduced from the topsoil. Uh, given the form and the size of the feature, several possibilities as, as to its function sprang to mind, uh, ranging from a well to a corn drying kiln or even a burial pit. After discussions with uh, LCAS, uh, further mitigation was agreed, uh, which consisted of a limited topsoil strip and a full hand excavation uh, of all deposits and features. This was initially conducted by establishing a 20 by 20 uh, metre box centred around pit 1504, which you, you'll again see. Uh, this was expanded as events uh, unfolded into an area measuring approximately 1,125 metres square. Um, there's an early uh, plan that I've put in, although it should be at the end, I suppose, but um, it's showing uh, what we found there. Uh, the initial pit has now been termed 104, and as you can see, uh, it's now turned into uh, a very uh, pear-shaped object. Um, the full excavation of the large pit revealed it to be a kiln. Uh, probably medieval in date. The kiln, now termed 104, was pear-shaped in plan and measured four metres in length east to west with a maximum width of 2.4 metres north to south across the base of the kiln. Uh, this reduced to 1 metre 30 across the mouth of the flue. Uh, the main body of the kiln appeared to be revetted into a natural ri uh, rise of the ground towards the west, which you'll see there. The rise only really became apparent during the strip uh, and it ran along the length of the site north to south. The kiln was filled by a, a mixed tertiary deposit consisting of bands of charcoal, flecked grey clay and grey-brown clay silt, uh, 0.24 metres in depth. This deposit overlaid a grey-brown sandy silt, which is a maximum of 0.32 metres in depth. A primary fill uh, of dark black sandy clay, uh, which contained frequent charcoal flecks, lay directly over the set stone surface. Um, this was noted in the evaluation. And now you can see uh, the kiln under, uh, under excavation there and a bit more of the stone setting. Uh, a layer of lightly fired light brown clay, which is 108, which you may see in that section, but you probably won't because it's on the other, other side, um, appeared to line the outside of the lower section of the kiln. This was 10 centimetres thick. Um, beginning roughly in a line with the top of fills 106 and 109. This deposit would probably have enhanced the structural stability of the kiln and would probably also have uh, maintained a consistent temperature during its use. Uh, finds within the kiln excavation were restricted to those uh, sherds found during the evaluation, 
and uh, additional few found uh, within context 106 during the excavation. Again, we think these were all redeposited uh, during the backfilling of the feature. So as the works progressed, uh, there's the western side of the site um, with the uh, the original kiln 104 there. Um, we opened it up. Nothing else was found on top of the ridge there. Um, but as we moved towards the east end of the site, um, a few things turned up, including two spreads uh, in the foreground uh, with the white bucket on. You have uh, 115 and another spread 112 is uh, to the rear. So there we have the excavation of the kiln continuing. A cubiana tin was placed in there and there is the kiln fully excavated. Uh, there we go. OK, the ceramic spreads. Uh, as the topsoil strip progressed towards the east, two deposits were found. Uh, these consisted of large quantities of redware. Um, deposit 115 um, was identified to the northeast of the kiln. Um, this had formed beneath the old plough soil 102 and consisted of a medium grey sandy silt. Uh, it contained a single dump of uh, medieval ceramics. There we go. Um, with occasional other sherds present throughout the remainder of the spread. Uh, the spread was situated on a gentle slope descending to the east and measured 9.2 metres by about 15 metres east to west. The spread reached a maximum depth of 0.42 metres in depth near the western extent. A total of 30 litres of ceramic material uh, was recovered from this context. Um, we had to do it in litres because there was so much of it. So uh, one of the white buckets is 10 litres. Given the concentrated, uh, concentrated nature of the ceramic dump, um, it would appear likely that this was deposited over a very short period of time and may even represent uh, a single action. So, The spread 112 was located to the immediate southeast of the initial kiln feature. Uh, the spread appeared to cut the old plough soil, uh, so it's stratigraphically later than 115, and consisted of a dark grey sandy silt. Uh, 255 litres of redware were recovered, with the majority occurring within the upper uh, 10 centimetres of the deposit. The spread as exposed in the stage two works measured 12.5 metres north to south um, by again 15 metres east to west. Uh, the stage two works uh, continued uh, under a watching brief um, which saw the spread uh, extend to the field boundary. Uh, again the ceramic material appears to have accumulated rapidly upon the existing soil. This appears to have formed within a slight natural hollow. The ceramic material is therefore likely again to present numerous dumping episodes undertaken over a relatively short period of time. Now the removal of spread 112 revealed a second curvilinear cut feature 114 which was partially obscured under the initial eastern limit of the excavation during the initial works. Uh, this appears to be a second kiln orientating towards the northwest. The kiln was again pear shaped in plan uh, with an overall length of five meters. However, unlike kiln 104, the kiln base um, appears to be located within the narrow, narrower part of the feature. Uh, you can see the remains there uh, in the lower frame. This was reinforced by the presence of a fragmentary set of set stone surface, uh, which I've just mentioned. Uh, the kiln base measured approximately 2.75 metres in length and was one metre in width, ending in a narrow rounded terminus. The kiln appeared to be pinched towards the middle with two set stones forming the probable flue opening, which you can see on uh, the left hand picture there. 
Um, the southwestern, uh, south, sorry, southeastern end of the feature appeared to form a shallow bowl 2.5 metres in width uh, and only 0.25 metres in depth. Um, and the northeastern edge of the feature was heavily truncated and no obvious edge was present. Uh, I think personally that the kiln feature was heavily reconfigured during its use, um, which would probably explain uh, its two working areas. Um, the kiln appears to cut through the spread, 112, which we can see at the top. So, as mentioned, it's strat stratigraphically later than 115 and is again overlaid by the buried plough soil. Um, the kiln base was filmed, filled by an in intermittent deposit of compact uh, grey sandy silt. Um, this in turn was overlaid by a thick deposit of dark grey sandy silt containing a mass uh, of charcoal, uh, 2.5 litres, I think, of charcoal, which was primarily recovered from between the two flue stones. Uh, a large amount of dumped redware sherds were recovered from the infilling deposit, 113, including the remains of at least three uh, large single handle jugs. So there are the jugs being excavated, and there they are exposed as much as we could before they were lifted. So nice close up of them. Uh, most of the jugs on the site were single handled. Um, they have those two nice um, attachment things on the bottom. So what initially uh, had looked to be a fairly uh, uncompromising archaeological evaluation uh, turned out to have produced two kiln features and a very large assemblage of late medieval ceramics, including the remains of several almost intact glazed redware jugs. Uh, other remains included occasional skillet handles uh, from my memory. Um, initial uh, looking, initial assessment of the material uh, has shown a very restricted uh, sweet ceramics and we think that most of them belong to the 15th century which links nicely in with the development of the chapel and the uh the construction of new roslyn um this the simple range of material produced on the site does suggest a degree of mass manufacture and this is probably for a local market um maybe even edinburgh uh, the survival of both of the cut features and material spreads is most likely due to their location on relatively low lying ground situated at the base of a slight north south rise. Uh, this became more apparent during excavation and it appears that the ground was leveled up somewhat during the post medieval period. Uh, the kilns are sited on the northwestern edge of the medieval borough of Roslyn, which would have been an opportune uh, location due to the attendant risk of fire and air pollution. It's likely that the nearby Glen and Burn, uh, which is on the northeast of the site, um, would have also provided readily accessible sources of water and fuel. Uh, a good source of workable clay would obviously have been important, but this was not visible at the expansion site. Um, lots of clay works, brickworks are in Midlothian, so I don't think they went very far for it. Um, pottery kilns of medieval date are fairly rare within the Scottish archaeological record, with almost all examples occurring either on the edge of the Burr settlement, such as Canool or clay pots near Perth, uh, or situated in a more rural location, acting as production centres for neighbouring boroughs. Examples of this occur at Rattray and Stenhouse, uh, the latter kilns probably supplying redwares to Falkirk and Linlithgow. Uh, the Roslyn kilns have similarities with those excavated at nearby Coulston in East Lothian. Uh, which is probably the closest of them. Though not well is illustrated, uh, the Coulston site appears to provide examples of pit and flue type kilns, uh, although their ceramics are largely 13th and 14th century in date, so slightly earlier. Uh, it's possible that the kilns were associated with the development of Roslyn on its present site during the 15th century. Uh, a programme of post excavation has been agreed, leading to a final report uh, which we hopefully will integrate the stratigraphic, contextual and descriptive data from the excavation uh, with a suite of specialist post excavation analysis. Um, finally, I would like to thank our clients Barrett Homes for providing us with the opportunity 
to undertake these works uh, and also Elena Gray at, at LCAS for her help and advice throughout the project. Thank you very much.